Hello and happy holidays and welcome to the Derry Runlet Show. Uh, it's quite fitting that we would be doing a show on gay rights at this holiday season because um, in November of this year, uh, they had a special celebration and that was, was called Transgender Day of Remembrance. And as a result of that day, Joe Biden went on national television and said, I am going to bring back and uh, enhance gay rights and transgender rights. And that's what this show is about, ladies and gentlemen, uh, during this Christmas season. I have two very important guests with me today. One of them is one of the most important people of my life, has been for the last 55 years when she was born to me at Bowdoin College. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, meet my daughter, Nicole Runlet. Nikki, how are things in Florida? Uh, a lot better than they are in uh, Seattle right now, I'm sure, weather-wise. Beautiful. The manatee are, are out and swimming around and uh, having a great time. And, uh, yep, the, the fish are jumping, and we're right, in, right into the frying pan, too. So we're definitely enjoying it. So you're down in Crystal River, which is pretty much the manatee capital of the world, so to speak, uh, watching the manatees come to the very spot where Chuck and Miles have their property and the manatees come in there and all the tourist boats come in there along with the manatees, right? Oh, absolutely. They're her and they all have their little noodles swimming around and uh, goggles and they sound, they sound like the manatee when they're uh, blowing out their snorkel. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of my favorite things down there, Nikki, is not only eat stone crab, but to watch the manatees. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my second guest is someone who is also very important to me because she's a fellow attorney, uh, or sister attorney, I should say, and she's also president of PFLAG in Portland. Sarah, welcome to my show. Hi, Derry. Thanks so much for having me on here today. And my first question to you, Sarah, would be, what, what do the initials PFLAG mean? So PFLAG is a, uh, we are a chapter of the national group, which is the parents and friends of lesbians and gays. And it doesn't have the letter T in there, uh, but we are an ally group supportive of uh, everyone in the LGBTQ plus community. And the national group was started back in 1972 and now there are over 400 chapters across the country. Um, our chapter here in Portland, Maine, uh, there's another one in Maine. Uh, the Waterville chapter is pretty active. And we are trying to do support and education and advocacy so that the groups of friends and families around uh, the LGBTQ community um, have the resources that they need to learn what they need to do to be good friends, good family members, and supportive of their LGBTQ loved ones. Uh, Sarah, right out of the blocks, in the last four years that you have been serving on that board with my dear friend, my dear friend and neighbor who was going to appear today, Beth Tyler, in those four years, have you seen uh, a decrease uh, in the rights afforded to gays and an increase in discriminatory behavior against gays and transgenders and people uh, of, of that persuasion? Well, there's no question that hate crimes have been increasing over the last four years under the Trump administration. Um, you know, while he's been so vocal uh, in so many of his, uh, his problematic areas, racism, uh, sexism, homophobia, trans, transphobia, um, I understand that uh, it's been about a 20% increase in the last four years, according to FBI numbers. Um, just last year, 2019, in the state of Maine, uh, there were about 19 different hate crimes represented, uh, and of those, uh, almost 40% were um, uh, based on people with the LGBTQ community. So those are terrifying numbers. Uh, it's that fear that is one of the reasons that, that family of LGBTQ people um, sometimes have a hard time accepting that their loved one is a member of this community, mostly because we don't want people to be susceptible to those sorts of, of attacks, and you obviously want your people to be protected. Uh, here in Maine, we have some pretty good, strong protections, uh, but of course, nationally, um, again, at least through the regulatory process, there have been reductions in rights across the board. I think uh, one of the biggest ones, of course, is in the military, tra transgender people who have served our country so well um, and, and vocally, and with the military's own support, uh, nevertheless, we're, we're denied the right to enroll. And I think that that hopefully is going to be changing again. Uh, Sarah, I wish to tell you, uh, as I preface my question to Nikki, that I was in Portland 
at Daring Oaks and was the first person to see Lady Gaga get off her bus. <laughs> With an entourage of 30 people, oh my God. And she got up and gave one of the best speeches I've ever heard. I didn't know, actually know who she was. And she got up and spoke directly to Susan Collins and Olympia Snow and said, you're going to be the swing vote on this uh, to, uh, to stop discrimination against gays in the military. Uh, I was very, uh, uh, very pleased to listen to her and then very pleased that Susan Collins and Olympia Snow both did vote that way. But Nikki, the question I want to ask you is this. You're watching the campaign of 2016 and you're watching the President of the United States point to a sign behind him that says LBGTQ for Donald Trump. And he goes, oh, look at this. Look at this sign. Look at this. Look at the support I've got. And then within days, within minutes of being in that administration, the first thing he did was what Sarah said, was to go after trans in the military. Then he's going after health benefits. And I haven't even gotten into pence yet. And that's, that's later. Nikki, how did that make you feel to see the president suddenly turn after getting elected? Well, I certainly think that one of the most surprising uh, statements you made was that you didn't know who Lady Gaga was <laughs> or didn't know much about her. But no, I actually, to think, um, to see you know, Donald Trump up on stage talking about uh, his support and how he had support of the LGBTQ community, once again, it, it's typical, uh, typical Donald Trump. You don't, you don't listen to what he says, but you, you watch what he does, his actions. And his actions sp spoke way louder than his words ever ever did. And he rolled back so many of the, uh, the all the the rights and the other guidance that the Obama administration had put forth. And he put I guess he went on a, a rampage of, of turning those back around. So um, yep, certainly wasn't a I wasn't a big fan of his, if you can tell. Well, uh, the other thing I wanted to say to both Nikki and Sarah uh, is that. What concerned me the most was that I think uh, a, a lot of people perhaps got uh, faked out. Uh, I have to say that when I heard him say that, I, I thought to myself, all right, that's, that's my guy. And then when Susan Collins voted for Kavanaugh, I'll never forget what she said in her speech. She said one of the things that I liked most about Kavanaugh was his, his position on gay rights. And what she meant was pro-gay rights, not anti-gay rights. And what does Kavanaugh do? He writes the, a scathing dissent in uh, the opinion we're going to discuss, uh, which is now uh, considered one of the best cases in, in the country on gay rights. Uh, so, Sarah, when the Gorsuch opinion came down, were you as faked out as many of us, quote, legal scholars were when the opinion came down for gay rights and Gorsuch was the one who wrote the opinion? I, I was completely shocked, um, you know, when I saw that that case was was coming up before the court, uh, and just as things have changed over the last four years, I was worried uh, about how things were going to come down. And um, uh, again, that was, you know, as, as you know, there were three cases there, uh, two with, with uh, uh, people who were gay getting discriminated against, and one with a woman who was transgender, uh, Amy Stevens, who unfortunately died before seeing that good news. Um, but it was such a thrill to see that, you know, that they did actually interpret sex discrimination to include uh, the gender identity and uh, the sexual identity of people. So it was, it was a thrill to see that. Well, uh, uh, getting back to the trans issue uh, in 2020, uh, it's 37, 37 people were reported killed as trans. And they also indicate that many of these crimes go unreported. <clears throat> so violence increased. Uh, and uh, this decision doesn't come until June of 2020, the Gorsuch decision. But Nikki, during that time, in the last several years, did you ever uh, uh, feel threatened? Or, or, or is it such that you are so obviously seen, maybe not so obviously trans as some people do going the transition period? We know, folks, that when the, when the person who is trans goes through the process, they change from male to female or female to male. Mm -hmm. And until they reach the end point, they, they're really in transition. Have you noticed yourself any sort of uh, uncomfortable behavior? Oh, uh, when I came out, uh, I was in Florida at the time. Uh, and you know, certainly you know, certain parts of the country can be a little bit uh, you know, more or trans friendly or trans unfriendly. And, and certainly there were some very awkward times for me 
as a uh, as a woman or a trans woman in her mid 30s who was transitioning certainly very awkward times in, in my parents the way I carried myself and you can tell in just the way uh, people either conduct themselves around you or how your friends may react uh, of course to your uh, your outward appearance uh, it, it certainly it certainly is something that was obvious and apparent to me um, fortunately, I didn't have any uh, extreme negative or any type of physical uh, type of retaliation or, or reactions, but it, it certainly it can be much worse for many, many other in the trans community. And I, I, really, I really feel fortunate that I did not, but feel just so bad for those that, that do experience the discrimination and, and the, um, you know, the physical harm. Uh, and Sarah, um, one of the reasons why you are a member of this organization is that you yourself have a child who is uh, transgender, am I correct? Yes, so my son, uh, who's in college now, but he came out to me when he was uh, 14, uh, first as gender fluid, and then uh, he did just realize he was transgender male. And so coming out in a you know public school system here in Maine, uh, one thing that I think is important to recognize um, you know, for transgender people as well as, as uh, gay people is that the harassment in schools is still uh, very prevalent. Of course, homophobia is a common sort of middle school slur that people, people use all the time. And so, uh, again, we were pretty fortunate um, with my son's experience. He was, he's, very, he's a very out child, uh, very out and proud, um, which not everyone feels comfortable being. Um, but they have some good civil rights activities, days in school, and um, good uh, GSAs. Uh, the folks at one of our uh, partner organizations, GLSEN, uh, help the school systems with their gay-straight alliances so that the youth in schools can get some support and hopefully help minimize the bullying in schools. Um, so that is certainly happening a lot as well, uh, as well too. And so we're, we're working to try to decrease that negative atmosphere. <clears throat> And now, Sarah, I wish to move to um, the more vocal person uh, in, in the um, administration. And that was uh, Vice President Michael Pence. And one of my biggest concerns <clears throat> was this was a vice president who not only leaned towards being anti-gay, but vocalized it on national television. He and his wife indicated a tremendous amount of pride in the fact that she refused to teach at any school that would allow either gay students or gay faculty. I want to ask you a question as an attorney, uh, uh, Sarah. How does a school enforce that? If two girls are holding arm and arm, walking through the corridor, or a guy uh, pats his buddy uh, uh, on the backside after he scores a point in a soccer match, or our two friends are uh, talking intimately with each other, do they get reported? How, do, how does a school enforce that? Do you know? <laughs> it, I, it's a rhetorical question. I'm not sure. Obviously, I don't think they should be enforcing it at all. And uh, the 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 decisions are coming down in our favor, but I think that, you know, the atmosphere of homophobia, the hallway discrimination that students face, um, again, what you really have is, is teachers and administration turning a blind eye to it and allowing that sort of bullying and discrimination to happen. I think that is, is a big prevalent problem that, we, that we're working to overcome. Uh, you know, I'm not sure about uh, Pence's wife's school there, what they, what they try to do. I think they have a religious exemption, and I think that's one of the difficulties. Uh, and, you know, I think Gorsuch, even in that good opinion, uh, yes. left, left a crack in the door um, yes. on the issue of, of religious exemption. So that's something we, we need to be, be mindful of moving forward. Uh, you know, the, the efforts here are not done. Right. And, and Sarah, one of the things <clears throat> that I noticed about that decision was just what you mentioned. Uh, those of us that praise the decision, like myself, because uh, I now see my daughter protected and uh, uh, my friends protected and folks I didn't. Uh, begin uh, the episode by just mentioning my daughter, but also I have many friends who are gay, judges who are gay, lawyers who are gay, and many friends who have children who are gay or trans. I'm not talking about seven or eight folks. I'm talking about dozens, dozens of people that in my life that this is their way of life and I want them protected. But Gorsuch did leave the door open. Sarah, do you believe that uh, in, in, in further decisions, 
we're going to see that lean toward, okay, religious, okay, we're, we're going to give you a pass on the religious thing, just like with the COVID thing in church, saying, okay, I'm sorry, uh, do you think that's going to occur I, I, again? With, with, uh, I wish I didn't think that was going to occur, but uh, with the newest justice uh, replacing uh, Ruth Ginsburg, uh, Amy, uh, Amy Barrett, uh, obviously she's got, uh, I don't know if uh, saying strong religious credentials is the right phrase or not here, uh, but I'm sure that was a lot of behind the reason why she's on there. So I think that that's going to be an area that is going to be litigated quite a bit. And, um, and I think we're going to have to have our work cut out for us in, in really understanding where those lines are drawn between religious freedom and, and protecting the basic human rights of humans. Um, again, I don't remember what the case uh, name was, but you know, the, um, the wedding cake case that came down yes, again, the not, in, cake. not in our yeah. favor. Um, so, so there's some, some fine lines to be working there. Uh, one thing, just to throw some numbers out at you though, just as you mentioned, Please. Derek, just, uh, you know, reviewing some of the Portland, uh, the PFLAG information that we have nationally, eight out of 10 people know somebody who is in the LGBTQ community nowadays. And so, you know, that figure, you know, that means so many people are allies. And I think that's part of the cultural shift as we realize that people are just people. Um, that's what's allowed the cultural shift to have everything be more accepted uh, that I think some of the more fundamental religions are, are fighting against. And so I think that um, we've got demography in our, in our corner, <laughs> but a lot of work to keep doing. One of the things that I was, I was gonna retort with that is so 80% uh, say that they are aware. Where are the other twenty percent living under a rock? Are they not? Are they not watching television? Are they not watching movies? Are they not reading magazines? Uh, I remember once I was doing Elvis Presley at Bowdoin College, and I was putting on my outfit. And this fourteen-year-old boy came by, and he goes, "Who are you supposed to be?" I said, "Elvis." He goes, "Who's Elvis?" And I said to him, "I says, where you been under a rock?" <laughs> <laughs> but so what you're saying is or certainly in certain areas of the country will remain unnamed. Uh, those would be people that would say, not, not only do I not know any gay people, I wouldn't hang around with any gay people. Uh, by the way, folks, those days are coming to an end. And I want to get back to the school situation. Uh, I want to ask this question of Nikki. Nikki, you, you and I have, uh, I've got three grandchildren, uh, uh, twins, Kyler and Turner, now 20 and in college. And Evan, uh, gifted and talented also in college, and they, uh, Turner and Kyler graduated with honors. Do you think uh, that they have, have changed in their attitudes uh, about gays, either because of you or because of having friends who are gay or trans? No, that, that's a great question. And, and I certainly do think that it, uh, it made them more aware, uh, to be certain, and, and as I guess we've pointed out, uh, the, the prevalence of uh, you know, children uh, coming out to their friends, uh, their peers, their, their family to let them know that um, you know, I, I'm gay or I, I'm transgender uh, or gender fluid, whatever that happens to be. I think that it's becoming more and more prevalent in the schools and therefore they're exposed to it. They realize that these are, are, are people just like us. So I, I, I think that uh, my, my coming out certainly made them more aware, but I, I think just uh, in general, everyday living, they're seeing more and more of it and are becoming more and more accepting at an earlier age, which is just wonderful. And Nikki, is it not true that as you were going through your transition, uh, Kyler and Turner had a friend who was going through the same exact thing, and they, they recognized the need to take this person under their wing, so to speak, to become friends, and they actually embraced that child that was going through that. that. That occurred while they were in high school, was it not? Uh, that, yep, correct. And, and you're right. It was a, a trans male and uh, became friends with both of them, in fact. And, and, I, and I certainly think, once again, they were sensitive uh, to what this uh, what young man was going through um, and perhaps some of the bullying that was occurring. And I think that they were a strong influence in, in trying to uh, help the others accept, accept the young man. Well, would you please uh, tell them I love them and that I, I appreciated that when they did it. Uh, folks, when uh, Nikki's and my book first came out, 
full circle, a father's journey with a transgender child written by both myself and my daughter, Nikki. Um, we went on a cruise with the grandchildren. I threw the book in the middle of the corner of the table. I said, here, take a look at this book. Uh, look at the pictures, skim through it, uh, because you need to know about it. Uh, and then they said, why, Papa? And I said, because you need to figure out who's going to play you if they make a book, a movie out of this book. <laughs> uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Sarah, um, uh, getting back to the the uh, Bar, uh, Bostic uh, opinion, Bostic versus uh, Clayton County. And by the way, folks, this was about a man uh, who was playing on a, a, a baseball team, a softball team uh, that was openly gay. He was a county employee. They said they fired him for, I don't know, other reasons, uh, but they proved, lawyers proved, uh, that it was obviously that he was gay. And that's the case that is now uh, going to be... be constitutional law till the end of time. Sarah, do you think at law school where you and I went, do you think that they are the constitutional law professors are, are making a big deal about that decision? <laughs> I certainly I certainly hope so. Uh, you know, again, how the Constitution's read, how the statute, uh, the civil rights statute is read is, is going to have an impact, you know, down the line. Um, I'll get my titles wrong, but the, whatever title that was, I think it was Title Seven that title governs seven. employment. Title Seven, yeah. And then the next question is the Title Nine, where right. there's a lot of action that governs uh, sports. Again, um, women and transgender people in sports is obviously going to be a big, a big area. Um, I hope you don't mind me going backwards a little bit, though, Derry. No, please, please do, please do. Just because we were talking about the support and eight out of ten people knowing LGBTQ people. Right. And, uh, you know, you generally you know, made a small comment about geography. And again, here in Maine, we have such a rural state and it's so big. I just want to put a shout out. Um, PFLAG's headquarters is here in Portland at the Equality Center, which houses uh, four different um, groups that support the LGBTQ community. Equimaine, uh, Maine Transnet, um, GLSEN, and uh, the Portland Pride Group. And Maine Transnet particularly has done very well over this pandemic, and even before the pandemic, actually reaching out into the rural areas of the state. So, of course, Portland is a hot spot of people and population where people can meet for support groups. But there are gay and transgender people statewide, and they're living in these rural areas, and a lot of them are staying closeted because they are uh, fear that they lack the support in their friends and families uh, to come out. And so uh, they are everywhere, and they need support everywhere. Uh, Maine Transnet's been good doing resources out there. And then the benefit here for Portland PFLAG, we do, of course, monthly support meetings uh, for friends and family to come. And it's peer-to-peer -peer support where we talk through what we're going through and help us process our feelings so that we can best support people. And we have had to take a pause during the pandemic because our volunteer board members, as wonderful as we are, uh, had a little learning curve on the technology. And so in December, we started our first online Zoom support meetings. And uh, the first meeting went well. Uh, we're very pleased with it. And that's happening again uh, in January. And the nice thing about this pandemic, the silver lining, is that people can join a Zoom meeting from anywhere in the state. So even though we're Portland PFLAG, folks from the rural areas, even from up in the county, can join in if they need that support. So I do want to do a little shout out, make sure people check. Um, it's uh, Our website, of course, is... Um, pflagportlandmaine.org and that's where you can get information about our support meetings and uh, get invited because of course we keep it um, uh, we do have some confidentiality and protections in there so just wanted to get back to that uh, that it does hit the rural areas as well. Um, uh, thank you Sarah and Nikki uh, with respect to you uh, pick it up on Sarah's point uh, and by the way I feel good that we're not hurrying because we have a, this could be a two-part show. Uh, I feel I want to ask you Nikki have you recently joined any groups like this P flag thing? Are you a member of any organization, either on the internet or Facebook, whatever, that support each other with, with concerns that are going on in the country? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, on, the, on Facebook, I have a, a couple of groups that I'm uh, a member of, uh, and, and LinkedIn as well. There are, are some support groups out there that you know, support uh, the employment ranks uh, of the LGBTQ uh, community. So I've certainly participated in those. Um, probably not as much time as I'd like to be able to spend with it, but you know, certainly a member and, and, and read the, the posts and the articles and, and such. Well, uh, I'm going to get back to this Boston decision, which I'm so fond of. 
and I'm going to talk some lawyer talk here. <clears throat> One of the dissents from Clarence Thomas, what he said was, there is no way that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was meant to include gays and transgender because they weren't even thought of back then. I forget his thing was, he said the concept of sex orientation was unknown in 1964. And therefore, uh, there's no way that they would have been considered or thought about. And you know something? I better agree with him, uh, Sarah and Nikki, because I submit to you, from watching all the shows about Lyndon Johnson getting that act passed, <clears throat> that if he had said to any of those, say, Southern senators or conservative senators, oh, by the way, uh, we want you to consider the, the, the gays and the transgenders and uh, people that want to change their sex, I know for a fact that many of those senators would have said, hey, hold on, President Johnson. I don't mind helping the, uh, the African Americans and the blacks. But no, I'm not going uh, no, to extend these rights to homosexuals. No way. Or people that want to change their sex so they can go use another Bible. So in, in effect, Sarah, can we agree that Thomas is probably <laughs> somewhat correct saying that those senators never were voted that. <laughs> he sort of corrected me. Well, you know, I mean, you know, what, what the people who voted for it had in mind is one thing. And I think I, I actually wrote down this quote in preparing for this uh, from the Gorsuch opinion, where he said, the limits of the drafter's imagination supply no reason to ignore the law's demands. And you know, that really gets to, you know, when I think about transphobia and uh, the excessive numbers of murders of especially uh, black and people of color, transgender women, especially, you know, that feeds in from the homophobia because someone who finds themselves attracted to that person is so internally upset about themselves because they think homophobia is a bad thing and homophobia is a bad thing and it gets back to the patriarchy. So the use of the word sex back in 1964 when we were talking about just women's rights, um, you know, that really is why homophobia and transphobia is such a problem. So I don't think it's problematic to identify that, that that is what, what needs protected. Uh, Sarah, I had did not read those exact words that you talked about with Gorsuch, but he's saying, I don't, it's not what they thought about, it's what, it's what the concept is of, uh, and, and, and what he talked about, and it's what I love about the decision, is we're talking about human rights, and that's exactly what Joe Biden said. When Joe Biden said, trans rights are human rights. Uh, and we are going to advance the rights uh, of these people. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that I also wanted to discuss uh, with you, Nikki, is, is this decision has now come down and absolutely and unequivocally protects gays, transgender, sexual orientation in the workplace. Uh, the, the, the religious thing is not going to work at that level. So, Nikki, have you experienced in the, in the last four years any sort of employment situations where you felt uh, that uh, there, there was absolute discrimination going on? Uh, I would say uh, definitely to that, uh, to that question. Uh, as you know, I'm, I'm working into my maybe third decade of my career. So uh, yeah, I've certainly experienced uh, you know, my career as, as both a male, as Nick, and as, as Nicole, a female. And there was a, a period where I would uh, you know, I was trying to interview for positions to return back to Florida so I could be closer to my children, your grandchildren. And there were certainly periods of time there where I would interview and would go through the interview process and get you know, into the late stages where the, the offer was pending a, a background check. And I would, you know, they would uh, conduct the background check, learn that my previous name was Ellsworth Turner Runlet the fourth, and and I and all of a sudden I'd get a, a phone call back saying that either the job had uh, been had been canceled or postponed, or that they were deciding to give it to someone else, or that I needed to jump through several more hoops uh, in the process. And so deep down inside, I, I knew that there was some discrimination going on, though nobody would come out and actually tell me that I was being discriminated against for obvious reasons. Uh, but I, I certainly had that experience, and, and uh, I, I'm sure others uh, can, can point out to very similar uh, experiences as well. Uh, and Nikki, what you're reporting to me is something that I recall hearing from you at least a couple times, 
when you said, oh my goodness, you won't believe this. I, I, they love me. They, oh, geez, they, they're all over me like a cheap suit of clothes. And uh, it's just a matter of a, you know, signing on the dotted line. And the next thing you know, oh no, oh my God, no. We, 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 we never implied that. And, and, and that's why you, you said to me earlier that, well, I can't prove it. And Sarah, that's uh, when I'm going to come to you in part two. But right now we're coming up on uh, 30 minutes of our first show. Uh, that's how fast it's going. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to wish all of you a very happy holiday season. Uh, behind me uh, on the wall is uh, Brenda Lee's uh, gold racket rocking around the Christmas tree. She just had her 76th birthday, and her song was number four on the top 100 this week, rocking around the Christmas tree. But I'm going to play for you as we sign off Silent Night for My Tie. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next month for part two. Yeah.